So, welcome everybody to the, this new seminar series, the Scilab Lab AI seminar series. We call it Applied AI in Life Science Research. And uh, I'm very happy to see uh, that so many people signed up for uh, today's event. Um, this is the first seminar in a series and it will be held uh, uh, between four and uh, six weeks uh, between each presentation. Um, so before we go in and to allow the uh, last to join, I would like to say a few words about some of the AI activities at SciLife Lab. And um, let me just close this. So the SciLife Lab Data Lab, the SciLife Lab Data Center, uh, where I am the AI coordinator, um, we have been working a lot and are working a lot on data management issues. And as we all know, um, for good, uh, AI and machine learning uh, requires build some uh, good and high quality data. But we're sort of launching a little bit more activities to support uh, AI modeling at SciLife Lab Data Center right now. And especially in, not, uh, on the technical uh, side and to support infrastructure, middleware, software, and the sort of uh, aid in the AI modeling life cycle. So not specifically uh, competence in uh, data science in that sense. Um, part of this is collecting requirements from the life science community. So I would really encourage everybody to send me your comments. Um, if you are working on AI modeling, um, if you have a uh, uh, lack of resources, what you think work well, um, we have a sort of tight interaction with, uh, with uh, for example, SNCC on, the, on resources. But what sort of, what, what are your needs so that you will be more effective in, in your AI modeling and it could be anything so so please get in contact with me this is something that we're starting up and we're expanding the capabilities at Scilife Lab Data Center to try to support uh, our, our scientists with in this field, especially on the technical side so with that I would like to uh, go over to today's main event and it uh, is the presentation by uh, Martin Eklund uh, Martin Eklund is Associate Professor of Biostatistics at the Department of Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, MEB, at Karolinska Institutet. Um, he did his PhD at Uppsala University, mainly focusing on computer-intensive methods for statistical model choice and validation. After finishing his PhD in 2010, he moved on to postdoc positions at the Section for Global Safety Assessment at AstraZeneca and at MEB, and during two, so 2013 and 14, he was based in San Francisco and worked at the Department of Surgery, University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. Um, Eklund is since 2015 based at MEB, where he focuses his research on developing personalized high-precision cancer management systems to reduce prostate and breast cancer mortality and improve diagnostics and treatment selection. So welcome, and uh, I will now stop sharing my screen and you, uh, Martin, should then share your screen. And let's see where I find you. But uh, I think I, um, how it happened now? I think you're still muted, so I need, I think I need to unmute you now. But this list, list is not sorted. Here we go. Okay, Martin, I think you're unmuted. Yes, so thank, thank you, you for that introduction. Uh, can everyone see my screen and hear me now? Yes, we can. Excellent. So I will just go into full presentation mode. Hello. Okay, so artificial intelligence for diagnosis and grading of prostate cancer in, in biopsies. Um, so as Ola said, I work on both prostate and breast cancer. Uh, today I will talk about prostate cancer only. Um, and uh, 
if you have questions about uh, AI applications for breast cancer, uh, I'm, I'm also happy to, to take questions and, and, uh, and uh, consider considerations about that as well later on. Uh, but prostate cancer is, uh, so why work on prostate cancer to begin with? Well, it's, it's a very common cancer. In fact, it's uh, the most common cancer for men and, and it's also the one with the highest mortality rate among men uh, in the Western world. So if you look at this world map, you can see that the incidence and, and uh, also mortality actually uh, are the highest in, in the, Western, uh, the Western part of the world. But the incidence uh, and mortality is also increasing in Africa, Asia, and South America, mainly due to uh, higher or longer life expectancy, but also a more adoption of a westernized uh, lifestyle. So if we turn to Sweden, there's about 10,000 new prostate cancer cases every year uh, in Sweden being diagnosed, and about 2,500 men die every year from prostate cancer. And in the population, we have about 100,000 men living with the disease, with the diagnosed prostate cancer. Uh, and this, of course, um, is a psychological trauma to the patient, uh, and it increases the risk of dying, of course. But it also costs a lot of money to the, uh, to the healthcare system to manage these uh, men. So why are these, why is prostate cancer a deadly disease and why uh, do a lot of men, uh, why are a lot of men uh, developing prostate cancer and being diagnosed with prostate cancer? Well, part of the reason is that the prostate cancer diagnostic and treatment decision or prostate cancer management sort of pipeline is, is quite inefficient, to be honest. Uh, so many of you probably have heard about the prostate-specific antigen test or the PSA test, uh, and most prostate cancers are diagnosed through the PSA test. Uh, but unfortunately, this test has relatively poor sensitivity, but in particular also quite poor specificity, and this leads to a lot of unnecessary biopsies in men uh, and a lot of a high rate of, of um, indolent prostate cancer being diagnosed, which we typically regard as overdiagnosis, uh, meaning that the patient would not die from prostate cancer had it not been discovered. Uh, he would die from other causes at the age of 87 from a heart attack or something like that. And, and diagnosing uh, such a disease is, uh, is only unnecessary and causes uh, trauma to the patient. So, uh, so that's part of the, uh, of the story to why, uh, why we have this high rate of, of prostate cancer diagnosis. But another part of the story is also the way that um, the biopsies for prostate cancer um, are being performed. So up until now and still actually, the, by far the most common way of, of doing prostate cancer biopsies is that you, um, that you do it blindly in the sense that you don't know where in the prostate the lesion probably resides, but you insert needles in a systematic template into the prostate to try to find uh, any lesion that might be there. Uh, and I think it's actually the only somatic uh, um, uh, tumor or cancer type where, where there has been no imaging really to try to find where the cancer is located within the organ. And thirdly, uh, after you have done these prostate biopsies, they go for pathology assessment. And um, a problem with that is that, uh, unfortunately, we have very few pathologists in Sweden, and even is, is the situation is even worse in, in, in the rest of the world, actually. Um, and, uh, and also, if you, so it's a scarce resource, and it's very difficult to, to get access to high-quality uro urological pathology uh, assessments. And, uh, another problem is that if you, if you give the same biopsy specimen to different pathologists, uh, they might not agree on the diagnosis or the grading of the cancer. And the inter-pathologist variability is, is actually very high when it comes to uh, grading how severe the cancer is according to the so-called Gleason scale or the Gleason, Gleason grade, which is um, the most important prognostic factor for prostate cancer and the main uh, variable that uh, uh, treating clinicians are using for, for um, deciding upon which treatment is appropriate for, for the specific uh, uh, patient. And the fourth uh, reason to why we see high incidence of prostate cancer and, and also relatively high mortality rate is that, uh, again, the treatment decisions are hard because we have very incomplete and noisy data for, for making the treatment decision. And, we have no predictive biomarkers at all for prostate cancer. Uh, so if you compare it to breast cancer, that's a, that's a huge uh, difference where you have specific treatment predictive biomarkers like, uh, for instance, HER2, 
breast cancers that you typically uh, treat with um, uh, Herceptin. So um, we have worked or we work uh, very systematically to try to improve all of these aspects of the prostate cancer diagnostic and treatment chain. And so a few years ago, we performed a, a very large study called the Stockholm 3 study, where we developed a prediction model uh, where we combined the PSA test or the PSA biomarker together with a bunch of other biomarkers to develop a prediction model instead of uh, to try to improve the operating characteristics of, of prostate cancer diagnostics. Um, and using uh, these different biomarkers, we predicted uh, if a man uh, had uh, clinically significant prostate cancer or not. And based on that uh, prediction, we biopsied the man. Um, and we performed this study in 2012 to 2015. So about 50,000 or 60,000 men were actually recruited to the study and about 7,500 men were biopsied within the study. So it was a, a tremendous undertaking. But what we, what we could show in this study is that by using a state-of-the-art prediction model instead of PSA, we could actually reduce the number of un unnecessary biopsies by about 45%. So the number of benign biopsies went down by about 45%. Um, and we could also reduce the, uh, the, the, the rate of uh, diagnosed indolent cancers, uh, which is, uh, is really important to reduce the problem of, of, of or the marked uh, problem of overdiagnosis with of prostate cancer. And we could also show that uh, if you compare to what the clinical situation looks like today, uh, we can actually increase also the detection rate of um, aggressive prostate cancer. Um, so we, we published this in 2015, and this is a, fun, a fantastic data source for, for, uh, um, for building on, on further research. And this is what we have leveraged now to, to tackle um, the pathology assessments and try to develop an AI system for aiding pathologists to, um, to uh, be able to be more uh, or improve reprodu reproducibility and, and reduce inter-pathologist uh, variability, uh, which in turn will then uh, lead to better and more accurate treat treatment decisions. So early this year, we published uh, a paper uh, where we described the development of, an, of this uh, system. And I will now in the coming slides um, discuss or describe a little bit about the results from this study. And then after that, I will also uh, say a few words about what we are working on now to, to extend this system and, and combine it with other um, data sources to do new things. So as I said, the, the Stockholm 3 um, study is a fantastic data source for building on, on, on new studies. And, and uh, so this 7,500 men that we biopsied within the study, they typically you biopsy a, pro a prostate with about 10 to 12 uh, individual single biopsy cores. So uh, you get about 10 to 12 specimens from each man. So in total, we had about more than 80,000 um, biopsy cores from the Stockholm 3 study. And these, all of these biopsy cores were graded by the same world-class pathologist, Professor Lars Egerwald at, uh, at uh, the Karolinska University Hospital. And, and he is, um, uh, so he's been instrumental in trying to standardize prostate pathology over the last 20 years and has actually written the WHO criteria for prostate cancer diagnostics and so he's a very well regarded figure in this field so this is uh, and we know also that he's very consistent and reproducible in his uh, in his grading and diagnosis so uh, this is also important as Ola said earlier um, the AI that you develop needs to rely on, on good data and we felt here that we have really uh, really good data high quality data from a large study and uh, and that that should be leveraged to, to, uh, to try to tackle this problem with high variability across different uh, pathologists. So the data looks a bit like what we see there to the right. Uh, you have a prostate biopsy, which is the uh, sort of purple uh, uh, tissue uh, specimen. And uh, they are on, on the glass pathology slides, which you can scan using um, super high resolution um, uh, digital pathology scanners. And each of these cores were also annotated with, uh, by the pathologist. So he had drawn black pen marks saying where on the biopsy the cancer was located. So you see the black pen marks there to the right. 
And uh, using this data, we aim them to, to uh, develop an AI system for uh, reducing the variability of pathology assessment. And, uh, and with that, we mean to reliably be able to predict cancer, but also estimate the amount of cancer or the millimeter cancer length in the biopsy and to assign the Gleason score, which, as, as I said earlier, is the most uh, important prognostic mark that we have or variable that we have for, for prostate cancer. So very briefly about the methods. Uh, uh, the data look like I showed on, on the previous slide. And so Kimo Kartasalo, who's been uh, instrumental for this work, uh, developed uh, methods for, uh, for doing the segmentation here to separate uh, the black pen marks from the tissue and to, uh, to create these masks uh, for the um, uh, for the images to, uh, to so that we know what on the image is tissue and what is the black pen marks and what is background and then we extracted uh, from uh, from the regions with cancer corresponding to the regions with the black pen marks we uh, extracted uh, little tiles or patches of the image um, which we then knew were, uh, corresponding to an image or a, a part of the biopsy where there was cancer and we could similarly we could extract uh, little tiles or patches um, corresponding to, to parts of the tissue uh, where we knew that it was not cancer. And these tiles could then be used for training a deep neural network. Um, specifically, we built on the Inception v3 architecture, uh, so which is pre-trained on image uh, net, and uh, which we then cut off the head of that network and, and, and uh, develop the, the last layers to be more uh, suitable for our problem. And uh, building a network, we, we trained it on, on all of these uh, patches that we extracted from the data. Uh, so we have essentially patches being uh, benign tissue and, and then other patches corresponding to Gleason, uh, Gleason score three and Gleason score four and five. Um, and Using all of these patches, we could then, uh, for each individual location of the of the biopsy, we could predict the probability of uh, of that area of the of the um, of the image uh, corresponding to, to benign Gleason score three, four, or five tissue, um, and those probabilities were in turn fed into um, a boosted tree classifier to then classify whether the whole slide was a, a slide with cancer or whether the whole slide was benign and if it was cancer, how much of each uh, or which Gleason grade uh, was the cancer or did the cancer have and also how much cancer was there on the, uh, in the biopsy. And then when we try, when we use this system uh, for predicting on independent test data from the same cohort, so still from, from Stockholm 3 data uh, that's shown on the top uh, panel here, uh, the area under the receiver operating characteristics curve is uh, on a man level 0 0.999, so pretty much perfect discrimination between a man uh, who, with only benign biopsies and a man with at least one biopsy with cancer in it. Um, and uh, we can also see that if you look on the third row here, for instance, in the, in the top table uh, at 90% specificity, we still have 100% sensitivity, which I think is a fantastic result. But this is still then, of course, on, on data from the same study as the data was, uh, as the network was trained on. Uh, so then we collected data also from, uh, from an external lab and then we scanned on a different uh, scanner. So completely external validation data. And for that, uh, the model performance decreased somewhat. So instead of 0 0.999 in AUC, we had an AUC of 0 0.98 about uh, roughly. So still pretty good and still a very high uh, specificity uh, with very high sensitivity. So, so still very nice results also on external validation data. Uh, but the most important thing I think is to actually be able to, uh, to to, to do Gleason grading consistently and reliably. So here we compared with 23, so the International Society of Urological Pathology, they have a reference panel with 23 sort of internationally well-renowned pathologists who, um, who work on standardization of prostate cancer pathology. So they have a, a data set called ImageBase where all of them have graded um, a set of biopsy cores. Um, so they have all done it blindly independently of each other. 
Uh, and then you can compare the pairwise cap up statistics across all of the different pathologists in this data set. And here you see the ranking from, from worst to highest. So, so worst meaning that you have the lowest concordance with the rest of the pathologist in the data set and the highest then you have the highest concordance with the, with the rest of the pathologist in the data set. And then we inserted our AI system into this set of pathologists and, and did our predictions. And that's what's shown in the, in the gray dot here that uh, uh, the AI system is not among the best of these 23 uh, pathologists, but it's, uh, it's within the range at least of, of world-class urolog urological pathologists who've been devoting 30 years of their lives to get this good at creating prostate cancer. So I think this is uh, the result that from this, from this study that I'm the most proud of actually. Uh, and since then we have made improvements on this as well. So uh, of course now it's, it's not a completely independent test set anymore, but nevertheless we, we have made quite significant improvements since then. Uh, and thirdly, to the third aim that we had was to also do cancer detection on the biopsy uh, uh, accurately to, to really try to measure how much cancer is there in a specific biopsy. And uh, the, the scatter plot to the right there show the correlation between our predictions and the reporting pathologist, in this case, uh, Lars Egevad. Uh, and as you can see, our predictions of the millimeter cancer uh, in the tissue and, uh, and Lars Egevad's assessment of, of uh, how much cancer there was in the tissue was also very high, so correlation coefficient of 0 0.98. Um, so to summarize, uh, we have a system, an AI system that actually reports 90% of the benign biopsies, so about 90% specificity without misdiagnosing a single case of cancer. Uh, we can perform cancer localization and tumor burden assessment as ac accurately as, as expert urepathologists. And uh, the Gleason grades uh, assigned by the AI system was on par with international leading experts on urological pathology. So where do we go from here? This is what we published pretty much in, in the Lancet Oncology earlier this year. And uh, the next steps is, uh, is to work on uh, generalizing these results and ensure that we can, we can keep this quality on external labs and in external scanners. Uh, we had one external validation set within, the, within this first paper, but that still doesn't mean that we can generalize across all different labs and all different scanners and all different types of, of prostate uh, um, tissue morphology. So I think AI safety is a, is a critical component of, uh, of applying artificial intelligence in healthcare in particular, of course. And typically when you talk about AI safety, you see uh, stuff like this, um, high profile people uh, warning about uh, artificial general intelligence and super intelligence. And although these are also very interesting, um, uh, problems and, and research questions to discuss. I think for healthcare, we really have uh, very concrete problems to tackle here and now, and that's how to ensure that AI does what it's supposed to do, and how do we uh, ensure that given a specific input to an, out, to, an, to an AI model that we get output that we can rely on, uh, and how do we protect the AI system against adversarial attacks? Uh, so to the right here, is an illustration published in Science, uh, I think uh, last year, where they have taken a picture of a, uh, of a mole and uh, added some white noise to it and fed it to um, an AI system, which originally thought that the image was completely benign or the, the mole, uh, image of the mole was completely benign. But when, after you add this white noise, it actually is completely confident that this represents cancer. And secondly, they also rotated the image and uh, showing that by rotating the image, they could also get a completely different prediction from the AI system. So this suggests that these kind of images or these kind of systems uh, are very susceptible to, to, to changes in the input data. And that in turn also begs the question of, of what happens when something goes wrong? Who's legally responsible? And, uh, and what does that mean in the context of, of, uh, of the regulatory framework that we, that we work in, in in healthcare? So these kind of questions, I think, uh, are, are very hard and very important to, to address. And I think that AI needs to be, or AI development needs to be a lot more like drugs. So I work a lot on, on uh, clinical trials for drugs as well. I will talk about that a little bit in the, uh, later in the presentation. But I, 
I really strongly feel that um, AI application in healthcare is still quite immature, to be honest. So it might be a bit of a provocative, provocative thing to say, but uh, I, I, I think that you see a lot of sort of crowd-pleasing announcements and, and, uh, and papers that uh, show fantastic results, but in a way which when you sort of dig a little bit deeper, you understand that they make quite unfounded claims actually. And uh, there's not enough thought, I think, on study design and how the study design of, of, a, of a specific uh, study impacts the, the, uh, uh, the conclusions that you can draw from the study. Uh, and I think that if we if we don't think carefully about this, we will see uh, uh, we will see cases where things go really wrong with the application of AI in healthcare, and we still we still don't have anything equivalent to the thalidomide scandal um, that uh, for drugs or something similar for AI. But I fear that that it might come if we're not careful. So I think it's important to to really acknowledge this scientific integrity and, and the slow and sort of painstaking process of developing rigorous uh, AI system. Uh, so this is something that we now work on on very very carefully with uh, with this um, uh, with this application of AI for prostate cancer uh, pathology. So as I mentioned before, to really show that we can make reliable predictions across, um, across data coming from dif different digital pathology scanners, and even within the same scanner, that it doesn't change over time, that there is no systematic drift uh, over time, which due to wear and tear of the machine or whatever. And also uh, to make reliable predictions across different labs, because we know that uh, the lab processes uh, are very different in different labs, and they produce um, images that look quite different uh, and it comes down to how you cut the tissue how you uh, stain it and and uh, and what uh, lab assistants that you ha have working in the in the lab etc and uh, a third component which is critical is to really be able to um, to address different types of very unusual morphologies that you see in in prostate tissues sometimes um, and to so if the AI system is presented with a morphology that it hasn't seen before, that that, that kind of um, prediction is flagged as unreliable. So we have a, a EIT health funded project called, which we call OncoWatch Image, where we collect um, data from a very large set of, um, of labs uh, scanned on a large set of different uh, digital pathology scanners. So we have partnered together with institutions in Norway, in Denmark, Finland, in Italy, uh, Germany, uh, Poland, and the UK to, to collect data for, uh, with the aim then of, of, of learning how to handle di uh, differences across different labs and scanners, and also to, uh, to develop a, a quality control system or an anomaly detection system to, to find these kind of predictions where, where you don't actually can trust the prediction um, and where, the, where it's very uncertain. And this all builds up to, to introducing, to taking the next step of not only developing these kind of system, but actually introduce them into, into the healthcare system as well uh, via uh, clinical trials. Uh, so we have, uh, we're developing a protocol for, uh, for, for um, uh, clinical trial for to implement this uh, prostate or uh, prostate pathology based on artificial intelligence in in uh, collaboration with a, a number of hospitals in Stockholm. Uh, this we had hoped that we could get this trial up and running during this year, but due to COVID, I think uh, we'll hopefully start during next year instead. And the aim with this um, with this trial is to. Uh, show that you can introduce AI-assisted pathology and implement it in, in a routine clinical pathology setting. Um, and that by doing so, that we can uh, decrease workload for pathologists uh, without uh, lowering the sensitivity to detect cancer. And also that we can uh, uh, decrease the inter and intrapathologist variation in terms of Gleason grading or ISOP grading, as it's also called. Um, and the design for this study is, is, is a randomized design then, so that uh, people are randomized either to standard pathology, where two pathologists will independently grade this, the same sample uh, to be able to uh, assess the concordance between these two pathologists, 
And in the other arm, they will, instead of, of grading independently, they will both use the AI tool, but still independently of each other, but, uh, uh, but be exposed to the predictions also from the AI system. And uh, then we can compare the, the concordance between the pathologies in the different arms. Um, and we will also have uh, Lars Egevad grading uh, of the biopsies in, in, the, in the trial to be able to then measure the concordance against him, which, which was the pathologist that we used for, for developing the system, and, uh, and also then to, um, sorry if you hear some coughing in the background here, I have a, a, a seven-year-old daughter here at home who uh, has a cold. Um, but anyway, and, and uh, we can also then uh, look at sensitivity and specificity in these uh, two different arms. Um, so that's the aim of that trial. Uh, but ultimately, of course, we, are not, we should not be satisfied with just reproducing what the pathologists are doing. What we want to ultimately achieve is something that is better than today's Gleason grading and, and uh, so that we can de deliver more uh, uh, better predictions with, with that have a stronger association with the uh, final outcomes of prostate cancer. And, but this is, is a very, very challenging problem actually for, uh, for at least two reasons. First of all, uh, for training data, uh, what the trick that we used for developing the AI system for, uh, that we published so far uh, was that we, first of all, we had 10 to 12 individual biopsy cores within the same patient. And those images could then be split up in, in a number of small tiles. Each of these tiles uh, we could associate with the label and which we then could use for training the AI system. But a man only dies once of prostate cancer or develop metastasis once from prostate cancer. So within a man, you only have one uh, event essentially, if you want to train against train the network uh, against longer term outcomes, which is ultimately what we want to achieve. And another problem is that um, uh, that this, this, the data that we have uh, is not uh, perfect um, for developing these kind of systems. Uh, and this goes back to what I said earlier about uh, sort of. Um, uh, making unfounded claims from what you can achieve with, with artificial intelligence, or at least um, that you make claims that not necessarily are true. They may be true, but you don't have the data to show it, but still you claim that you made something. So the reason to why I have the basketball players there to the right is that you can think about this um, uh, from, 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 from looking at basketball players, for instance. Let's say that that, uh, that the data that we have now, uh, we don't see what would have happened if you had used uh, the AI system because the AI system is not developed yet. So the analogy with the basketball players is that you, let's say that you take a bunch of kids and have them play basketball, then uh, height will be very important for saying who is good or bad at, at playing basketball. And similarly, uh, sort of high ha hand eye coordination skill will similarly be also be very important for, uh, for a very important predictor for saying who will be good or bad at playing basketball. But uh, if you then select only the, the tall people to play basketball, then height will not longer, be longer will no longer be a, a good discriminator of, of basketball ability. But that doesn't mean that it's not. Uh, um, uh, that is not an important predictor, and it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's a less important predictor than hand eye, hand eye co coordination skills. And similarly, that's the kind of data that we have today. Uh, we only have the data; we only see data today conditional on the original pathology assessment. So we only uh, see data only selected, pre-selected, like the basketball plays plays being pre-selected on height. So when we compare a new system uh, like the AI system against uh, the old system, human pathologists, the human pathologists are being sort of discriminated against in that comparison. Um, the fact that they made the original selection means that they will, there will be a negative bias uh, towards human pathologists always in the comparisons that we make. And that's what I feel that um, uh, you see a lot of, uh, of, of papers making claims that they have outperformed human pathologists, but that is in fact not what they have shown. And in fact, Google came out with a paper saying that they had uh, an AI system outperforming um, 
uh, human pathologists uh, with this exact kind of, of study design. So we wrote a, a corresponding uh, paper to, to that or a letter to the editor for that paper uh, where we show that, that this, uh, this outperformance uh, could be due to, to study design completely. And the, I've never got actually so good reviews for any paper that I've ever written before. So it's clear when I think that when, when, when this is sort of explained to people that they see this problem, but, um, but it's an important problem and uh, unfortunately not addressed uh, to the extent that it should be at the moment, I, th I think. And speaking of that a little bit more, um, this is another paper that came out in Nature uh, for breast cancer diagnosis in mammography slides. Uh, early this year, uh, also by Google, where they claimed that, that, uh, uh, that they have an AI system that would outperformed uh, human radiologists for detecting breast cancer in mammography, mammography images. And I think if I remember correctly, they, in eight places in this paper, they, um, they, uh, they claim that their system outperforms the, the human pathologist or radiologists. But in fact, again, it could be completely due to, to uh, problems with the study design because the images that they looked at were from were pre-selected based on the uh, based on radiologists who had already sort of um, filtered out all of the sort of human detectable cancers in the data set. So, if you left in the data set were were cancers that are uh, potentially easier for the AI to detect but harder for the humans, but they could also be vice versa cancers that are easier for humans to detect and harder for the AI. But those are not present in the data set anymore. So again, you have a bias against the radiologists, but not, not, not in one single place in the paper that do they discuss this problem. And I think that's, uh, that's a shame. And, and um, it's really something that would be impossible to do uh, in a drug study, for instance. Okay, enough about that. Moving on here a little bit, also in the interest of time. I see that I'm using up all my time here. But um, uh, a third. Uh, thing that I discussed early on in the pre presentation here was around systematic biopsies and the problem with uh, with um, inserting uh, biopsies into the prostate uh, without actually knowing where the uh, where the lesion in the prostate is is likely to reside. And we have a large ongoing study, or it's not actually ongoing at the moment anymore, it's, it's just closed and we're writing this up for publication here now, where we combine um, the Stockholm 3 test that I talked about uh, in the beginning of the presentation together with magnet magnetic resonance imaging of the prostate to, um, to try to, uh, again, improve the way that you diagnose prostate cancer. And the data from this trial will be super interesting to use uh, to combine with the uh, images from the pathology slides um, to try to link uh, features within the MRI images to directly to the same location uh, uh, that the, the biopsy was taken from. So, uh, and that can have uh, a number of different uh, implications. First of all, you can combine the MRI images together with the uh, with the pathology images to, to in, improve uh, prognostication even further. But secondly, you can also potentially go directly from the M M MRI images and uh, improve prognostication, um, which can have uh, large implications for treatment selection. As, and the fourth thing that I wanted to touch upon is, uh, is, is actually treatment selection and the problems that we have for prostate cancer with treatment selection. And as an example of that, I will take met metastatic prostate cancer, which is a big challenge in, in, in Sweden and also elsewhere. So we have about two and a half to three thousand Swedish men uh, who get diagnosed with, or, uh, with metastatic prostate cancer every year. And we know that the combination of, of certain drugs like hormones and chemotherapy can improve uh, survival, but we don't know which patients should get what treatment. So the, the um, response rate to each treatment is quite low. It's only about 35 to 40% or 20 to 40%, some, something in that range. And these drugs are also super expensive. So it leads to a very costly trial and error process for the physicians to try to find the right drug for the right patient. Um, and there's a need for predictive biomarkers for, for predicting what, uh, what treatment to give to each patient. Um, so therefore we have started the ProBio trial, uh, which is uh, a, a trial where we try to do exactly that. So we have 
a hypothesis that by matching uh, the right treatment to the right patient uh, based on uh, genomic profiling of the, of, of the tumor, we can improve uh, progression-free survival. And we test this hypothesis in a, in a multi-center international randomized platform trial. And here we use um, a liquid biopsy for, for doing the genomic profiling of the, of the tumor. So we, the tumor releases um, a tumor DNA into the bloodstream. So by a, a blood uh, draw from the patient, we can amplify um, uh, the genome from the tumor and uh, using that to categorize the, the tumor into different classes depending on the, uh, the mutational landscape of that particular tumor. And based on that, uh, that, uh, that class, we can then assign uh, different treatments. So what is a platform trial? Well, a platform trial is when you have uh, a standing trial where you generate new hypotheses and, and test them uh, continuously in the same, in the same trial. Uh, so it's not a, a one one shot thing where you set up a one to one randomized trial. Uh, here instead you have uh, for testing one hypothesis. Here you have a set of hypotheses, so pot potentially an infinite number of hypotheses that you run in uh, that you test in a in a um, in a machinery that you build for 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 uh, for testing these hypotheses. Uh, and the important aspects of this, uh, I will come to that in a in a bit as well, but the important aspect here is that you can use this kind of system for many different things. First of all, you can um, adapt the way that you do uh, the randomization so that you use the data within the trial to actually, um, uh, to actually uh, um, decide what the treatment should be for patients later on in the trial so that you are changing the randomization probabilities depending on what has happened in the trial before. And this is something that we do in, in ProBio. So um, the trial design for ProBio is, is super complicated, as you can see on this schema here. But the important part to point out here is that uh, within this schema, we use uh, what we call adaptive randomization. So again, if a patient with a specific biomarker profile has responded well to a specific treatment before, the next patient with the same uh, genomic profile of the tumor will have a higher probability of, uh, of being um, randomized to that specific treatment. And the idea here is that this, this then sort of frames the whole, uh, the whole um, idea of a clinical trial into something that is essentially an instance of reinforcement learning. So we're linking essentially clinical trials to uh, methods for, uh, for artificial intelligence, where you can start to apply those kind of methods also in a trial setting. So this, uh, this is very similar to the problem that has been developed or addressed in, 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 AI, um, uh, in the AI community for a very long period of time. So how do you, do, how do you choose uh, between a set of different options? What treatment should you give to a, specific, uh, to a specific patient? Do you go to the usual place, which, we, which is uh, typically called exploitation? You, know, you use the knowledge that you already have about the treatment uh, for a specific biomarker profile you know that that has tended to work well before, so you use it, or do you test something no, new for this specific patient? So this is, a, um, this is the dilemma of exploitation versus uh, exploration in, uh, in, in a clinical trial setting. And here, for the ProBio trial, we use a Bayesian uh, adaptive randomization um, uh, engine for, for, doing, for balancing the, the the, the dilemma between exploitation and exploration, but I'm almost convinced that this is actually, this can be improved. And I think that tools for, that have been developed in the AI community for a long period of time can be applied also in this setting. And, but it leads to very challenging uh, mathematical problems actually to, to solve. And uh, so I just recruited now a new, a new researcher from, with a pure mathematical background to work on this problem, which I'm very excited about. Um, and, um, yes, so, so the end thing here that I want to, to touch upon is that for ProBio, we will never really cure men with a pro from their prostate cancer. They will still die of the disease. But what we can do is to keep them alive for a long, for longer period of time and have them with higher quality of life. But in order to actually cure more men from, from prostate cancer, we have to move uh, treatments 
earlier on in the disease setting in the natural history of disease. And that has been tried before, but without any success. And here again, I think that the reason to that is that uh, why it was done in the 90s, actually, without any success to move a systemic treatment of, of prostate cancer early on in the, in, the, in the natural history of disease, and why it failed was for two reasons. First of all, it was, uh, uh, it was an unselected patient. So you had the wrong denominator, essentially. You had patients with, um, with uh, uh, some of them probably had very uh, aggressive disease, but some of them didn't have very aggressive disease because you had the problem with very high variability between different pathologists, so, so uh, leading to poor prognostication. And that means that you cannot select a very high risk population and your, the effect size that you have is going to be diluted by a, a large number of patients with not so aggressive disease that will never die of prostate cancer, meaning that your power for, for the study goes down tremendously. So with the right uh, prognosticator, uh, or with the right system for doing uh, prognostication, you can get the right denominator in the trial and actually show a good effect size, I think. And the key to doing that is, again, to like a like we showed or talked about earlier on in this in this presentation to uh, to use AI system for uh, for improving the prognostication of prostate cancer, and secondly, the other thing is that these the old trials from the 90s were done in a, uh, without any treatment predicted biomarkers. So what we can learn uh, sort of at warp speed in the uh, metastatic setting for prostate cancer can then in probio can then be applied earlier on in the treatment system, uh, in the, sorry, in the natural history of the disease to actually cure men that today die of prostate cancer. So this is the ultimate goal, I think, of ProBio. Uh, and, and, but in order to get that, we need to merge and, uh, AI development with clinical trials. And the whole, this whole thing, all, all, everything that I have talked about builds up to improve a prostate cancer diagnostics and treatment in a more advanced and personalized um, chain going from early detection with more refined prediction models via imaging uh, MRI for uh, localizing where in the prostate that the, 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 the tumor is likely to reside and, and using that for, for improved prognostication. Uh, and, um, once you have the, uh, the disease diagnosed to do genomic profiling, to be able to assign the right treatment to the right patient. And all of this then can be uh, thought of as a, as, a, as a standing trial, essentially, where we can generate data, improve uh, over time gradually to get to a system where, where uh, innovation doesn't take 20 to 30 years in the healthcare uh, sector, but we can use uh, important uh, surrogate proxy outcomes for um, for for the end result of of, uh, of a of a patient's outcome uh, to generate quicker results and a, uh, and a faster knowledge uh, turnover and knowledge cycle uh, to uh, to decrease uh, the costs of, of uh, managing prostate cancer in uh, in the population, but also of course more importantly the mortality and unnecessary suffering for patients. Uh, so thank you. That is all I had to say and. Of course, this represents work from a large number of, of, of uh, people, uh, PhD students and postdocs in my group, but we collaborate very closely together with Henrik Granberg at, at MEB and um, uh, Tobias Nordström and, and Johan Lindberg, who are the key players in all of this work together with their respective groups and, uh, and then some funders, of course, to be able to do all of this work. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, that was a great presentation. And we have had a lot of questions coming in, uh, written in the, uh, the chat. So I will sort of uh, start from the top and go down and we'll see how, mu how, much we, uh, how much we have time for within the time frame. We are, we are going to end uh, 11. Uh, so Arne Elofsson uh, writes first, uh, in the medical image recognition studies, for instance, by Google, results have been impressive. The accuracy has dropped significant, significantly when used in clinics. Um, and I think you alluded to this in your presentation. Is this a, the case here also? And what could be the reason for this? I don't know, but maybe I should, uh, maybe Ar I should give Arne the, the word in this sense. So if you would like to elaborate on this. All right. Right, I think you answered to it. I, I wrote it down in the beginning, so I don't know if you. you I think you've just been mainly answered during talk later. 
question. I wrote. Yeah, and you also had another question later down we can take right now. Could can something be gained by using additional biomarkers data? Is that also answered? Arne? Okay. It would, it would be interesting to hear what you think about because it's 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 clearly using just images and certainly a lot of other data. The man, you can do whatever you have use. Uh, I mean, you have your RNA data, but it's in general. Do you think it's a good idea to combine them, or is it is it just the images are more, much easier to handle or more standardized? Or no, I think you should definitely combine it, um, uh, and I think that. Like I talked about, we have this chain of, of diagnosing and treating prostate cancer, but it's very similar actually for, for breast cancer. And you start with something that is cheap and, um, and easy to do. And in, in, for prostate cancer, it's typically a blood test with, uh, with PSA. And uh, for, for, for breast cancer, it's a mammography image. It depends a little bit on where you start this process. But uh, irrespectively, I think, uh, the further you go down the, the diagnostic pathway and, uh, and ultimately the treatment pathway, you generate more information about the patient and that should always be used or fed back into a prediction model to, uh, to improve um, decisions along the whole uh, diagnostic and treatment uh, pathway, essentially, to, uh, to answer very briefly. Um, Oshin Sharma is asking, uh, for Gleason grading, are you taking into account any morphology information? Yes, I mean, this is based completely on the morphology. So we take the image of the prostate tissue and, and with the image comes the information about the morphology and that's what we use, nothing else actually. Peter Wager writes, in the feature vector stage at the network head, is it singularly, singularly from image information or is other information injected? No, only imaging so far. Um, Next question, can this AI system use already in the in real life clinical setting? Does it need regulatory approval in order to be used by healthcare providers? That's an excellent question, uh, which I like a lot. <laughs> no, I, I, I would not use it uh, out of the box right now. Um, I think that more research is needed. I think that it could be used in a, in a, in a trial setting, uh, but not a, in a clinical setting. So it, I would like to do it within the trial, but not just release it uh, to, for, for, uh, for use. And yes, it definitely needs regulatory, regulatory approval in the, long, uh, in, in the longer perspective for being used. And I think initially going for something like a research use only product, it could be possible, but eventually uh, a CIBD uh, declared device is what's needed for, for, uh, for, uh, for, wide, for implementation on a wider scale. Uh, next question. You mentioned that uh, the, the neural ne network you used was pre-trained and you just pruned the network at some level to make it suitable for your purposes. <laughs> Usually when doing AI, one uses a network with a predefined structure, but training is done solely on this selected training set. Why did you need a pre-trained model in this study? Well, I'm not sure if we needed a pre-trained model, but, it, uh, but that's where we started and that's where uh, we potentially we could have done de novo training uh, and got an equally good state in the end. Um, to be honest, we, we didn't try that because there are so many different things to explore and you have a limited set of, of time and resources for doing all of that exploration. But uh, uh, so to answer very briefly, I think it was a very pragmatic choice that we just happened to, to go with and it turned out to work well. But I should also mention perhaps in this context that we have been running a Kaggle competition using this data uh, where about more than a thousand teams actually joined the competition for solving the same problem that we have worked on. And uh, it's very interesting to see all of the different architectures and uh, approaches that they, those teams have been using. And they have also actually improved significantly, I would say, on, on the results that we have so far. So it's, uh, all of those results will be presented at the Mickey conference next week, actually, which uh, should have been in, in Lima, Peru, but uh, is, of course, virtually now. A thousand teams, that's quite impressive. I guess you learned a lot from that. Yes, exactly. It was very interesting to, to see all of the, uh, the approaches that they used and what you can learn from that. Because, I mean, we have had essentially two and a half to three PhD students working on this uh, full time for, for, for a while, which is still quite a lot to, in, in one way. But here we could scale this whole process across 
actually, I think the, the median number of people in each team was about five. So about 5,000 people working on this problem, which is, uh, of course, something that is impossible to do on your own. Yeah, so I assume that means that uh, that uh, a lot of the data is available then at Kaggle. Yes, in this Kaggle it is, competition. It is uh, possible to still join Kaggle. The competition is closed, but uh, you can still join and, and explore the data there. Okay, let's move on. I was wondering how you can tackle the issue of morphological uh, histological heterogeneity. That's also a very, very good question. So, uh, and that's a, also challenging because I think the one thing that we need to do is to ensure that you have a wide range of different morphologies in the training data that you use. So what we can see that the more data, the better it gets. And, um, uh, but, but still, even with this very large data set that we had from the Stockholm 3 study, there are very unusual and uncommon morphologies that, have, that, come, that pathologists come across every once in a while. Um, and, and those, I think it, it might be challenging to, to get enough training data to actually reliably classify them. And there it's, that's why it's so important to be able to, uh, to not only make a classification for a specific, uh, or a prediction for a specific uh, set of input uh, data, but actually also um, assign some sort of confidence with that prediction so that you can flag a, an unreliable prediction for human intervention. Uh, and not just uh, make a prediction, which is essentially just a, a guess. Um, there's a question if the product is CE approved. No, 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 not which, which no. category? No, it's not CE approved. If it would be approved, what category would it be? Uh, well, I think, I mean, as I said to one of the uh, previous questions, I think it, it should be done in uh, in a, sort of in a tiered fashion where you go for a research use only product initially and then go for CIVD clearance. And as many of you probably know, the, the, reg, uh, reg, um, the legal framework around CIVD products is changing in, in Europe and uh, due to COVID it will probably be delayed a little bit, but, uh, but it will change in like 2022 or 2023 or so. Uh, and it will be a lot stricter than it will be much more like it is with FDA approvals in the US. So, um, so I think that is the ultimate uh, end goal for a system like this to be widely used. Uh, is the prostate cancer Stockholm 3 data publicly available? No, it is not uh, for several reasons, but uh, we, if you want to collaborate uh, and get access to data, we're more than happy to, to accept or to, to look at pro or proposals. So what you need to do is to contact me or Henrik Kronberg and, uh, and send in like a concept proposal for, for what you want to use the data for. Uh, overall, the accuracy is very high in the test data shown in Rock Curve. Did you check the errors AI made? Is it random or, or uh, it misses specific patterns in images? Did you open the black box of the AI? <laughs> yeah, that's also a really interesting and good question. Uh, we did to some extent, uh, I suppose the question is. So interestingly, the AI is, if you look, if you compare to the 23 pathologies that we used for um, as, as a reference panel, uh, the AI performs um, very, very well on the images that where there is where there's high variability in the data set. So meaning that if uh, the, the, the cases where the pathologists have the largest disagreement, that's where the AI uh, is more consistent with, with sort of the, the pack, the whole, the whole pack of the pathologists. Uh, and vice versa. So the, the patholo the, interestingly, the, 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 the cases that the pathologists tended to agree the most with, there it was more difficult to, for, for the AI to make improvements, which I suppose is, is logical in a sense. So I think this shows, the, uh, what this tells us is that, uh, that um, uh, it's a small data set, but nevertheless, I think it, it, it suggests that uh, for, for cases where you have high variability, uh, an AI system can make sure that those, uh, those assessments become more consistent across different pathologists. Um, you mentioned the ultimate goal as predicting out, uh, actual outcome and not gleasing grade. What would you say is the toughest challenge in training an outcome-based predictor? Uh, well, I think it's, it's the uh, limitation of, of, uh, of uh, the number of events that you would have for, 
for learning or for training the system. So um, we have, as I said about in, in the entire data set, we haven't scanned everything, but in the, in the entire Stockholm 3 data set, we have about 80,000 biopsy cores. Each core can be broken down to like a thousand uh, tiles or patches. So you have millions of, of uh, patches that can be used for training, uh, but it's, but even if you collected all of the, all of the uh, or data on every man that dies from prostate cancer in, in the whole world, it would still not be the same amount of data. So I think that's going to be the major challenge. So, so, so the, the logical way to do it would be to, of course, build on a system that we have now and which you can then use for some sort of transfer learning to a more uh, time to event kind of setting. And the final question that uh, there is, in the feature vector, yeah, in the feature vector stage at the network head, is it singularly from image information or is other information injected? And you, uh, Martin, answered so far. What do you see in the future? Well, <laughs> yes, what I see in the future, I, I see, um, I mean, I think that, that a lot of my presentation was about the future, I suppose, but, but I, I really think that, uh, that, uh, high quality AI development is going to be a critical thing to, to, uh, to focus on in the coming years. And I see, I think that that is something that people will to a higher and higher degree realize. And I, I feel that people, I mean, we who have been working in the medical field for a long period of time has a responsibility here to, um, to ensure that we do this sensibly. And I think that, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of what we have learned for drug development, for instance, over the last hundred years needs to be applied also uh, for AI development. And uh, so I think that's one key component. And the other component, as I addressed as well a little bit in the talk, is to merge AI together with, um, with clinical trial development, which I also think will be the key for, 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 for clinical translation of AI systems, but also perhaps even more importantly, uh, improving the way that we do and run clinical trials today. And I think there is a lot of improvements to be made there actually. So thank you very much, Martin, for, for uh, a, a very good talk and a good discussion. For everybody, I can say that uh, this, this uh, presentation is recorded. It will be published on uh, the Scylaf Lab web. And, uh, we have a look at, out for the upcoming presentation on, on November 5th at the same time 10, uh, when Sven Lander will uh, give a presentation on data-driven discovery of treatments for nervous system cancers. Uh, so the registration will, for that will open today. Thank you very much everybody for attending. And uh, thank you especially again to Martin Eklund for a great presentation. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you for, for having me and inviting me here. Goodbye.